I'm Father Alan, I'm the assistant priest here at All Saints Margaret Street um, in Fitzrovia, just north of Oxford, uh, Oxford Street. Um, and uh, it's good to welcome you, Alan, and, and your viewers here to, to today. As I was walking up to this building, I was kind of very conscious that you almost can't see it. It's, is it the most surrounded church in, in London? It's, Would, it's striking. Did it ever stand alone? It, it, I suppose it never did. It was built amidst the, 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 the thriving rag trade, as it were. A lot of people living um, who were working in the big department stores on Oxford Street. Um, and as you say, uh, sort of slightly hidden, despite the height of the spire, which is, which is one of the tallest in central yeah. London. Um, you can see it beautifully from Primrose Hill, but also adds to the uh, surprise when you actually uh, get inside. Signaled, first of all, by this great big pointless buttress um, with one of the uh, sort of a single but cathedral in, in, in scale. And with that beautiful scene of the Annunciation um, uh, carved there, one of the earliest Anglican representations of, of, of that uh, biblical scene. Since the since the Reformation, um, oh, so that that predates the building so, of the church. Uh, no, v contemporary with it, but 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 um, sort of the first one of the first instances of, of, of representative sculpture in in the Church of England. Oh, I see. Post Reformation, okay. um, of course, slightly Butterfield. The architect um, was eccentric in, in in numerous ways, and and you're sort of led through this this gate. There was originally a screen across the um, those gaps as well, which were uh, taken away during the, the war. Um, so even more uh, enclosed than, than it feels now, but you're sort of drawn through the gate towards the, this great buttress and then to this slightly eccentrically placed porch, um, which gives the impression of having been added later, or, 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 but, but is, is completely part of the same design. So uh, designed in 1850 by William Butterfield and really a model a a experiment in in building um, on the ideas of the, the Oxford movement, so that re revivification of the Church of England and of understanding um, of the continuities of the Reformation over the disruption um, of, of that period. But yes, this, so this is um, perhaps the first fulsome experiment in, in that, in, in, in a um, built um, context. So 1850, um, we, we get this uh, design from William Butterfield, sponsored by the, uh, the Cambridge Camden Society and a kind of aesthetic branch of the Oxford movement um, and paid for by a man called Beresford Hope, who had an interest, in, an MP who had an interest in, in this sort of um, area of the church. A man of means, um, I assume. Man of means, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. So uh, Newman came here, Pusey came here, another figure in the, the, the as it was before the, the Margaret Chapel. Um, there was a chapel on this site which they colonised oh, and actually took actually on this site? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that so dated back? That was an 18th century building okay. that, that I'm, I'm unclear about its origins, but um, very plain um, building. We've still got the original um, triptych that, uh, that, that was in the, the, the oratory um, in the Margaret Chapel as it began to grow towards this, these Anglo-Catholic ideals. Um, and then the, the time came and the money came for, the, for this, this to be erected. And of course, Butterfield was looking back to, uh, well, English architecture in part, um, uh, 14th century particularly, but uh, people come in and look to uh, Florence, um, to, to, to Italy, to Italian Gothic as, as well. It's, it's a quite a blend of, of um, of stars and quite an idiomatic design, as we'll as we'll see inside, I suppose. Do you know Streatham, Christchurch Streatham? It's That's another it. one with this poly. Is, is it polychromic? Yeah, bit, uh, brickwork. Structural po polychromy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, often people imagine that it was in brick to cut, cut costs, but in fact, this brick ended up costing a lot more than it would have done to to build the whole thing in in ragstone. Certainly. So it was it was quite a, a statement of. Um, um, of intent in, in, in many ways. I think it said on Wikipedia £75,000. Yeah, which I... Which I'm, I'm sounds never... like a fantastic <laughs> amount of money for, yes, for back then. For, for, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Botsfield was quite convinced that the church shouldn't be open until the interior was finished, that that was you know, essential, an essential part of his uh, what, what he was doing here. And so, although the, the structure was finished around 1850, it took another nine years for, for the church to... To, okay. to open. Oh, um, come on, let's go and have a look yeah, then, because uh, I come tell you what, in. it's quite cold out here. It is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
go. Here we go. I mean, there is this, everywhere you look, there's no surface that no doesn't surface. have something quite wonderful. Yes. And this, you can imagine what sort of impact this had in mid 19th century Britain. Um, the Oxford movement never became a, perhaps we, we could say it was mainstream, but we couldn't say it was majority in any, in any case. And, and um, this would have been quite an assault on the senses of, of your average Victorian um, uh, churchgoer. And of course, some people very much took, uh, took issue with it. This is you know, some of the earliest reintroduction of, of images into the Church of England. So you'll see the stained glass with, the, with angels and saints, um, the, uh, the great slightly later um, tile work, uh, scenes from the Old Testament and the New. Oh, so the tile work wasn't part of that nine year <coughs> so, uh, but Butterworth? No, even, so even, even that, that was a little bit late. I think this is 1860s uh, and 80s. Um, so the, at the back you have that wonderful, um, those types, Old Testament types of the, of the Eucharist. You'll see the high priest Melchizedek. Okay, who's Melchizedek? So he was a, an, an Old Testament um, high priest and, and sort of a type of Jesus Christ in, in, in Christian under, understanding of the, of the Old Testament. I'm, so, I'm going to have to ask yeah. you that. What does that mean? What, so, so, do, do you mean he was a prophet or...? Um, not quite strictly a prophet, but so, uh, so Christians b believe that the Old Testament essentially points towards Jesus Christ. And so we understand... Um, those books uh, of Hebrew scripture as, as pointing toward the, the, the Messiah. And so um, Melchizedek in, in Jesus Christ's priestly function um, is, is, a, is a type, as we say, of, 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 of Christ. Um, um, so he's uh, not a historical figure. Uh, he's a... Well, bo both oh. and, yeah, yeah. This would have been familiar to, to, to worshipping Christians yeah, of, of all denominations, you know, of all types of Church of England, I suppose. Yes. Um, and this was quite a statement in it's, it's kind of, it's backing up this Eucharistic focus at the other end of the church, which in a sense was controversial to some Anglicans, the idea of an altar, um, the idea of a sacrifice uh, of the mass was quite controversial. But this is, a, is it in a sense, propaganda saying, look, here's the Old Testament evidence that this is what we're meant to, to be doing. And so Moses, Melchizedek and Abraham would have been immediately recognisable to, uh, to, to 19th century Christians. So that one I recognise, that's yeah. the story of Isaac and... Um, Abraham and, yeah, and, and Abraham. Uh, and, yeah. and then what did you say was in the middle? That's Moses. Oh, Moses. Uh, yeah, so you'll see Moses on the left of that panel um, and the, the, the serpent um, being a, a prefigurement of the, of the cross. So it's just as the... Um, Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Christ was lifted up, up on, the, on the cross to, to redeem it. So I forget the story of Moses in the desert. The Israelites are disobedient and are threatened with, through God's wrath um, uh, through the serpents. And uh, Moses uh, persuades God to, to, to relent. And uh, the serpent is changed into a, um, a golden uh, staff and heal the, the, the Israelites from their stings, their bites. So, so, so in this representation, the, the staff is the cross. Yes. Are they, are they dragons around, um, flying around there? <laughs> that, that's interesting. I, I, you, you can see the, the more conventional snakes um, lower down, but I'm not sure what those flying ones are meant to represent. I mean, I'm, I'm saying they're dragons. <laughs> yes. They, they, <laughs> I'm, I'm, wings, I'm asserting yeah. it <laughs> yes. with, with no further evidence. Yeah. Here we jump to the, the ascension um, of the Lord, of course, coming up in the liturgical year. St. Peter with the keys, uh, St. John, typically sort of youthful. And, um, so I, I think there are only ele one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eight. So there are 11 disciples, two angels and men. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. So, oh, so the yeah. two guys in the middle are angels? Yes. It's just difficult to, <laughs> to, to, to talk, actually, because everywhere, everywhere I look, I mean, I'm looking at that ceiling, the patterning. I mean, it's. I, it's, I can, it's I'm a, beginning to understand why people are saying this yeah. is so, yes. so influential. At the east end, above the, the um, altar, is our frescoes originally by Dice. Uh, William Dice, a Scottish um, artist associated with the Pre Raphaelites. 
um, interested in the Italian Renaissance um, and uh, did um, a number of the frescoes at Westminster, um, the uh, national um, uh, depictions uh, um, and Arthurian legends there. Um, unfortunately, his work here deteriorated. It was fresco work and, and deteriorated quite, quite badly, quite quickly. And so these were repainted uh, in the, I, I'm guessing, 1880s um, to a similar design, but, but they're not. You couldn't call them William Dice. As we look into the chancel, this, this gives us much more of an impression of the architect and um, textile designer, uh, Sininian Comper. So he, he uh, only died, I think, in the early 60s, so he had quite a long career, but um, he began to uh, uh, reshape somewhat Butterfield's um, original um, scheme. It's slightly unusual means of reserving the sacrament. It harks back to a medieval, quite typically English custom to have the, the blessed sacrament uh, in, in a hanging pyx. So you see a tent-like structure within the, the silver. There's a, a, a winder that uh, brings it down. The, uh, the silver is, is fixed in place. And that, that was given in, I think, 1928 by the Duke of Newcastle, who was um, an aristocratic Anglo-Catholic. And, and he gave it in memory of the, the choir boys who died during the, former choir boys who died, died during the, the Great War. Um, but also got around the bishops um, problem with reserving the sacrament on the high altar since it's hanging above oh we got around that one as well so some people don't even like candles and yeah, you, you, yes. you've gone full yes. candle. so this is the full easter tide Super. array i think it, only the or, only the, the oratory in, in in kensington has has a bigger paschal candle than, than us that's a that point of, okay. of pride i had a man at a carol service who's obviously some sort of great butterfield expert who came marching into the sanctuary saying where have you put the original Butterfield um, candles? And what are these Baroque monstrosities? <laughs> As though we'd just done it. But of course, this, this happened in 1911. So, so um, it's, for most of the church's life, it's been, it's been a little bit more um, Baroque up, I suppose, than, than, uh, than Butterfield's original, original intention. Although it has to be said that Butterfield remained um, as architect in residence, as it were, from the 1850s to his death in 1904. So, so, he, so he, he would have he, been yeah, yeah, he, part he, of the yeah, changes. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, in the, so these are the replacement, Dice's replacement frescoes. Here you have the 12 with uh, St. Paul, uh, Our Lady, and then St. John is the Oh, is that's the John, other, is it? Yes, yeah, slightly. Often androgynous John. <laughs> yes, yeah. Then above you have the, the, the saints in, in heaven. There are the symbols of the, the evangelists. Um, looks like John the Baptist makes an appearance. I'm trying to see John the Baptist where? Um, I might be wrong, but I'm thinking that bearded fellow in the, in the red holding some sort of stuff above those two um, ladies in, past, in pastel colors. These guys with black crosses? Yeah, so those are the, the fathers of the Eastern church. So there's a, there's a Greek icon. Yep. Uh, called the All Saints icon. Right. It's got it's got a circle in the middle and and and, and a throne and, and and then but then the saints are arranged around it and they're often arranged in a kind of order that repeats, which is why I recognise the yes the, the black the, the pallium, crosses. Yeah, yeah. But it does feel like that's what this is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm, here you've got the the fathers of the Western Church. So you've got both in a nice touch. There's East and West coming coming together. Yeah. Um, Saint Jerome. Saint Ambrose, I suppose that one is. Augustine is number three, and Pope Leo the Great. We can tell he's a pope from his hand. Yes. Do you remember what Leo did? So the tome of Leo was, was an important statement of, of uh, doctrine, receiving some of the Eastern language into Latin. Mm -hmm. And then above, the, we have children's saints. So Hugo, Fina, Rumwald, Secunda, William, Maxima, um, Hil Hilary, Donatilla. Who so, are these people? I think these are these are early <laughs> martyrs. So oh, okay. So yeah, they're all holding their palms. Blandina, Emerentia. Oh, you've got tremendous eyes. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, <laughs> I mean, yes. Okay, we're going to leave it there. This church is completely impossible to walk around without being interrupted by something amazing to look at. So we're going to finish the rest of the church next week. Uh, we'll take some time separately to look at the influence of the Oxford movement as a whole. 
we're going to face down the the U word associated with this church, the ugly word. Pevsner used it. One critic said of this church that Butterfield had a sadistic hatred of beauty. We'll see whether I agree with that or not next time. Oh, and don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment.